Thank you, Tanya, and to all who have joined the session today. I want to um, uh, share with you some of my favorite brushes and how I generally use them in painting uh, in my sessions uh, each day. And what I have found with these brushes is that it's interesting because, you know, Painter has so many, so many brushes. And uh, over the years, I found that um, I start culling or pulling out these brushes that really create magic for me in my painting process. And I found that a lot of these uh, wonderful Bob Ross brushes have become just that. They become my go-to brushes where when I need to create a cloud or I need to create a soft mist um, or a feeling of depth and atmosphere in the painting, I start pulling these brushes out in Mystic Mountain, Sunset Aglow, Blue Moon and Campfire. So they're all starting to become part of some of those go-to brushes um, that I uh, look for every day. And the other topic I wanna talk to you a little bit about today is um, creating that feeling of magic, that feeling of atmosphere in your painting. Um, I was always told that change was good for you and that it allowed you to grow. And being an artist is all about that transformation and that growth and every painting that you complete is a learning experience and you become quite skilled in understanding why you like or dislike your painting. And that is growth, whether you recognize it or not. Uh, when you take that opportunity to sit back and look at that painting and really evaluate it for its value contrast, its color, the complete atmosphere, and all those things start to make sense to you, then that really is um, growth in your artistic ability. And the ability to paint doesn't happen overnight. And for most of us, it takes uh, a lot of time to develop, develop and we have to be patient with ourselves. So remaining engaged in your painting is really vital. And so when you pick a painting or a photograph um, that you want to uh, work from, be sure that that image excites you from the very start. Um, because if it doesn't, it's going to be a bust um, and you, you just are not going to get anywhere with it. So when you start with that photo, pick something that's familiar with you and something that fills you with passion. If the subject is a lovely waterfall in the forest, then, you know, try to close your eyes and imagine yourself there. And even though you might not be there, try to feel that and sense it in every way possible. These are some of the things that the great landscape artists have done, the masters over the years. They go out into that field or by that waterfall and they take in all the light and the complete atmosphere of the place that they're painting from. And a lot of times they weren't able to complete those paintings in one session. So they had to go back to their, in our case, our office or go back to their, uh, you know, their studio and they had to finish it. But a lot of times they had to finish it in their minds and trying to sense how it was when they were there. We talk about a lot of different kinds of light too. And there's direct sunlight and overcast light and candlelight. And one of my favorite lights, hidden light sources. So let me share with you just a few little paintings here that um, I've done with these, entirely with these Bob Ross brushes, uh, the Mystic Mountain, Sunset Aglow, and Blue Moon. And then we'll get into Painter and I'll show you how I completed some of these paintings. Um, I wish I had time to completely do a complete painting for you today, but I really wanna share with you some of my favorites and some of the ways that you can utilize them uh, in your uh, painting process. Uh, this painting, I, I just love this, the way this painting came together because of the fact that um, I love the uh, atmosphere that I was able to create, the glow on the dress as she's walking through the forest. And a lot of these were just done with these uh, Mystic Mountain um, and Sunset Aglow brushes. The trees in the background were used, I used a brush called trunks, which I use quite often now for just creating very expressive tree trunks uh, in the middle ground and in the, the uh, background areas. 
The other, uh, uh, this painting shows uh, various brushes found in both Mystic Mountain and Sunset Aglow. And the thing about um, this particular piece is we are actually doing a class um, called Paint Like Bob Ross, um, the digital way um, at Digital Art Academy. And uh, this was one of the subjects of, of the class is painting what we called Enchanted Path. And the whole uh, premise of the class was to use the brushes, to utilize the brushes, and to create a very atmospheric uh, uh, conditions within the within the painting. So here, what we were trying to show is uh, a very backlit type of painting where the sun was low in the horizon and how it affects that area in the background, the trees, the light, the way the light would reflect and uh, just you know maybe touch just the edges of the trees. And there are times when you might be out on a trail in the early morning or the late evening, and you try to visualize how that light would feel, how it would uh, be kissing the edges of the trees and reflecting off of the uh, branches on the upper branches and maybe casting little reflective light here and there um, as you're walking along. So um, these brushes, uh, Really, really, um, you know, I, I can easily paint with these brushes uh, entirely uh, one in one painting session without really moving into even some of the default brushes or even my other custom brushes. And if anyone knows me well, I love creating brushes. It's one of my favorite uh, pastimes with painter. So I enjoy, um, you know, always reaching out and trying to um, take my traditional experience that I've had with brushes over the or with with uh, different media over the year years and trying to bring that same feel or look of those brushes into um, into painter. Utilizing texture uh, and specific brush settings can also really be really have a powerful impact on your painting. So never miss that chance to utilize texture from applying overlays to paper texture. And I'll show you a little bit of that uh, here as we get into painter. Um, in the Sunset Aglow brush category, uh, I had a lot of fun with this painting. Uh, the, the, I used the trunks brushes, but I also used the Impressionist Sunset brush to create the rich texture of the redwood trees. And uh, this brush is, uh, uh, can you can utilize it in several different ways with, uh, you know, creating different colors with it and um, uh, very much uh, reacts to paper texture. So you can get some very, very interesting uh, brush strokes from it. And it has a very, I thought it created a very, almost the perfect look for a redwood tree. So I was able to really uh, enjoy uh, that process with the, with, with the um, Impressionist Sunset brush. Um, in Sunset of Glow brush category, the um, Impressionist Sunset was also used again to create the texture of the trees that you see in the background. Um, and one of my favorite brushes in the uh, category is the sunset grasses and this was uh, painted with different sizes and values to help to create the rich grasses of the meadow. So you can see that um, taller grasses in the foreground as we move back into the distance all I needed to do was change that size of the brush, a little bit of color variability within the brush and uh, uh, really was successful I think in creating the meadow type grasses. Um, in the Blue Moon brush category, which I'm going to be uh, going into, into Painter as well, um, there are several wonderful, rich, br expressive brushes in that category. And remember that visual concept. Um, every good painting begins with a strong visual concept. So take the time to really plan and you will have you'll be much happier with your outcome. And many times it will be that visual concept that motivates you to go on and paint it. I mean, we're constantly bombarded with beautiful art all over the 
all over the web. And so for that reason, we take um, lots of motivations from our current um, colleagues that paint in Painter, our students, um, and even the masters. So there's lots of motivation going on uh, in the digital art world. And remember to get out and experience nature. If you love landscape painting, you have to know it and you have to know it well. So get out there and experience it. Take in the sounds and the smells and the shapes and the colors that you see and try to imprint those, uh, imprint them into your subconscious as you explore. And this will bring you closer to your subject and help you to become a much better painter. So let's move now into painter and get busy with some of these brushes. Hold on a second. All righty. And I'm just going to close a screen here. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this painting and where I'm going with it. And I'm going to try and finish it for you here uh, during our session. And I started this painting with a basic sketch um, to form the direction I wanted to go. And one of the great illusions in creating uh, an environment is making the viewer believe that there is depth and there is space in that flat two-dimensional painting. And that's where um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tools and techniques that we can use to give our paintings those qualities, um, which really help to create and capture a believable rendering of natural light along with a strong sense of atmospheric perspective. So I, I really have um, a love for Hawaii, and um, so I was uh, contemplating where I wanted to go with this painting, and I, I really enjoy the, uh, the Hilo side of the Big Island, where the whole landscape is much different than the Kona side, which is very, very dry, and the Hilo side, which tends to be much, much, much wetter and very lush with vegetation. And a lot of times within these little uh, valleys and uh, waterfall areas, there's these little, uh, little shacks that appear that are just perfect painting subjects because they're so old, they're rusty, the wood is degrading. Um, they just, they just have a lot of character. So, this painting is, is a, has a lot to do about aerial and atmospheric perspective. Um, and it's, it's that making those objects appear lighter and less detailed the further away we are from them. And bringing that center of interest into focus as we develop it. Um, I also created the foundation of the image um, after the ske sketch was done with a gradient fill. And for those of you that are familiar with Painter, you'll know that we have what's called the interactive gradient. And when I select that, it gives me an option to choose several presets plus any custom presets that you you know created over over time. And then the really wonderful thing here is there's a new option here called Express Paint. And when I apply a Express Paint and I have chosen the basic colors that I'm going to be working with, that color gamut that I want to expand upon, then I like to check, I like to use what they call heavy dabs to create a um, textural background to begin the painting with. So my sketch would be on one layer, my gradient fill would be on the next layer, and then from that point on, I would start building my painting uh, and working through it from uh, background, middle ground to foreground. There's also something else that I enjoy doing quite often before I start a painting. And probably the reason I do this is because of the fact that I have tended to work uh, traditionally with oils, acrylics, watercolors, and I love 
surface texture. There's something about having a canvas texture to begin your painting with. And there are always many ways to apply surface texture or canvas texture to painting, but I wanna show you a way that I like doing it and have done it for several years. And probably the reason I like doing it is it's because it's called non-destructive. It means that I have the ability to change it because it's on a layer. It's nothing is permanent um, where it gets a little bit tricky um, if you apply it on the canvas layer and you have uh, exhausted your undos and you can't go back. Uh, this way, I love uh, applying it this way because it gives me that opportunity to always delete it, remove it, change it, work with the composite methods. And that is uh, one of the ways that I really, really enjoy working with Painter. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this layer out here and I'm gonna show you how I do this. Um, I'm a fan of paper textures. I love creating pa paper textures as well, and I have a quite a, a, a large variety of them. Um, so I'm going to open these up for you, and I'm going to go down to one that I created. You can see I have lots of them. Let's see if I can find the one I want. Here we go. And the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that the scale of it, which is the paper scale and the contrast and the brightness are about what I think is appropriate for this particular size painting. So when I go over to my navigator, which I keep open all the time, um, I love having my nav navigator open because it gives me a, a good idea of how my values are holding together within the painting. Do I need to go darker in a certain area? Am I too dark in a certain area? Do I need to go lighter? Uh, it helps me to see my highlights and my darker values. Um, so I oftentimes will keep it open, but it's also a nice visual to know what size the painting is and then what size my scale should be on my paper. So I realize that this is quite a large painting, so I need to probably work with a larger scale on my paper texture. So I begin by filling this layer with what we call a gray scale. And the shortcut is Command T or Control, uh, I'm sorry, Command F or Control F for fill. And that brings up the fill option here and you'll notice that it says current color and that is the color I want because I've already set it over here and we're going to select OK. Um, on the uh, color wheel, and let me open this up real quick, a 50% gray is um, 128 in value on HSV, zero on H, uh, hue and saturation is zero and value is 128. On RGB, it's 128 all the way down. So that's just a quick way of getting to 50% uh, gray. And then what you want to do is if you use that color a lot, just add it to your, your colors so you can get to it and your color set library so it's an easy color for you to get to and use. So once we've had, um, once we've filled this layer with color, and it would normally be in what we would call default. And it looks like I've got some, I'm going to back out of this because it looks like I've got some uh, opacity on that. And I don't want that. I'm trying to find out why. Oh, I know why. Okay, so we go back there. I'm not sure why I'm picking up. I must have, uh, I know why, nope. I'm not sure why my opacity is coming through there. Okay, let me back up here.
making sure that is that. I don't know why my <laughs> I'm stuck there. I don't know why that is happening. That is crazy. Um, Karen, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I was busy answering questions, but people are saying that the layer opacity is set to 60. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much. Very okay. good. Thank Everybody. you, guys. <laughs> okay, so we've got our uh, our over uh, our canvas filled now, and what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and apply that paper texture. So we're going to go to the effects menu. We're going to go to uh, surface control and apply surface texture. And what we're going to do is base that surface texture now upon paper. Now the nice thing about this is you can go a little bit further in your appearance of depth uh, because of the fact that you are working on a layer so it gives you the opportunity to bring that opacity down and that, thank you guys for catching that because I did bring my opacity down on that layer and that's why, so I have that capability of working with that. So you can see that paper texture is coming through. It's just kind of a brushy uh, paper texture with lots of brush stroke on it. And I'm just gonna go ahead now and select that amount, bring the amount up to where I feel it's appropriate. And I typically will keep the shine and the reflection at 0% and the picture at 100, which is the default. And then we're just gonna go ahead and select OK. Now what we're going to do is change the composite method to overlay. And when I do that, and I zoom in here, now you can see that I've got that nice subtle texture coming through. And I just love being able to start with something like this. Then if I feel the texture is too strong, all I need to do is just bring, bring it down to a point where I feel it's working and it, and it feels good. And then I'll just go ahead and lock that layer and I'm good to go. So now I've got some nice paper texture there. I just feel much better about going into the painting. I, I like having that underlying, te underlying top texture going on and then being able to uh, start developing the painting going forward. We're going to uh, talk about the palm trees first, and we're going to go to a brush category called Blue Moon. And within Blue Moon, there's a there are two um, two brushes here: one called Palm Frond Grainy, and one just Palm Frond. And we're going to choose the grainy option here. Um, for the palm trees and I'm going to open up the layer here and we're going to start with the palm trees and we're doing this specifically on a separate layer again lots of flexibility there for you to work lots of uh, ability to work with opacity to change composite methods and going forward it just gives you a lot more flexibility so what I typically will do here, I started these palm trees with the Mystic Mountain um, uh, landscape brush. This is basic uh, uh, number two, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the two inch landscape brush and did, did some basic uh, rendering of palm trees. But then I wanted to develop these a little bit further and I felt that this particular brush in Blue Moon would really help to do that. So what I'm gonna start to do is just to work into this. Now I have a paper texture setting uh, going on here and you know it depends on how you wanna work. Now, if you wanted to impart a little bit of texture into that brush, uh, a lot of times that works out beautifully. But if you're working just uh, on with the basic uh, brush, then I think that that's probably more of where I want to go with this. And I'm just going to start by using my Alt key to sample color. And I do this quite often uh, in my painting process where I'll just sample the colors and um, uh, work through the original underpainting. And I want to be careful about edges here. Uh, anything that is 
going to be reflected into the light, into this area of light that's being developed here. Um, the color is going to be a little lighter as I go over to this darker side that I want to be able to pull in color that's going to work and reflect in that area as well. So you'll notice I'm just tapping the edges. I'm just creating these real soft edges within this grouping of trees right here. Um, there are many times in the process of painting where I will uh, pick up my brush calibration if I don't feel the brush is um, rendering the way I feel it should be. Then a lot of times I'll just pick up my brush calibration and do some calibrating. So we just go into this area. There's a feeling that maybe there's a over a tree coming up from this foreground area here. I'll softly go into this area and just gently develop some of the palms in this area as well. So I'm really, I'm really taking advantage of the colors that are already in the painting from the interactive gradient overlay that I added. Anytime that you can overlap shapes, let's go with a much smaller brush here and maybe pick up some little shapes of palm trees back in the way in the distance here just to vary some of the shapes. As we come down, getting a little larger down here. And just, you'll notice that shape just starts, trees just start to form from color, from the values that are already in the painting. And that whole area just becomes much richer. little areas of light, you know, anywhere you want to pull. It's always fun to have just little areas that capture the light coming in from above. This is, this is one of those paintings where the hidden light sources, you don't know whether it's, you're going to see where it's coming from in a minute, but it's revealing itself in different areas within the painting. All this area of mist that you see going down from the visual path of the, of the waterfall and going up uh, was all done with the um, Mystic Mountain two inch landscape brush. And this brush is nice because it, it does have a reset setting where you can go from blending areas to increasing the reset to apply more saturation to the brush or more paint to the brush. Now, uh, the next brush I want to show you is trunks. And that one is in the sunset of glow brush category. And this one I, I love using because it's uh, you know, it's a um, it's very expressive brush, um, just real nice for just putting in. You know, I was thinking, well, maybe I can put in this feeling of like bamboo down here. So that's kind of what I was going for with uh, these little 
quick little brush strokes. You just kind of see how it digs into the paint. I love that. And just adds a little extra. That little extra feel of um, foliage and branches, trunks and whatnot coming out of the forest, out of the tropical forest. The next brush is the Glow brush. And Glow is from the Blue Moon brush category. And the brush that I use for that is called Moon Glow. And when I started painting this, I thought, you know, it might be fun to uh, put a little bit of glow in the windows and maybe have like a little lantern hanging down across this little uh, little bridge that's going across from one landmass over to this over to the little shack. And um, again, I actually do this on a layer and I'm going to be picking up a color and I think probably what I'll do is start maybe with sampling this color that's up in the sky here. And I noticed I wanted to have a little bit of a glow going around this uh, little lantern here. So I'm just going to very softly touch on it and create just a small little glow coming from that lantern. And I did the same thing with the windows here so you can do that same effect by giving a little bit of a glow coming uh, from the uh, windows. Uh, it works also very nicely for creating a sun up in the sky or just creating a glow around the moon or even just using it to create a moon with. So it's a, it's a nice brush uh, to use in that respect. Um, I could even see using it maybe in really big and just adding a little bit of a glow in certain areas that you might want to uh, emphasize. So I think that works really well. It's just a very small little indication of light, but um, I think it went a long way to add um, maybe a feeling of light coming down from below the, the shack a feeling of warmness that you get from the couple sitting on the porch. The next brush is uh, Campfire Sparks, and that one is in the Campfire brush category. And this one is um, originally was used in the um, in the sample image or with a campfire uh, to create sparks coming from the fire. But what I actually use it for um, traditionally in some of my paintings is just to add a little more um, atmospheric conditions in the, in the uh, atmosphere around the buildings, around the waterfall. And what I'll typically do is pick up a light color and then I just scatter it here and there just one of those little simple things that you can do to add uh, a little extra magic when you're creating these magical type uh, landscapes almost like fairy dust you never want to go too far with it uh, sometimes it's just uh, the smallest amount that makes all the difference in the world just having that little bit of light a little bit of sparkle coming from uh, especially works nicely with these uh, dark paintings where you really can capitalize on the light coming from these paintings. Uh, the next uh, brush I wanted to show you is from, uh, let's see, from the sunset. No, this would be from Blue Moon, I'm sorry. And that would be the Bougainvillea brush. And this one, uh, you can see that I started filling in the bougainvillea here and uh, 
chose some specific colors that I wanted to work with. Um, I have a real specific brush uh, or um, color set open here that I'm using. And uh, I like the, the colors that uh, I was able to capture from it. And um, so I'm going to start on that layer, just working uh, into the bougainvillea a little bit further. And uh, important here to remember that uh, this isn't a very um, strong lit painting, but it gives you the opportunity to play with uh, creating a little more light and, and lightness and darkness of these flowers as you go down. So probably I would keep the flowers a little bit lighter in value on this side where there's a little more light and just subdue those colors as we go back. And this brush can be used very, very delicately. Um, let's see. I think I'll go back to maybe this color. And again, I sample all the time. <laughs> Once I have that basic color in that I kind of know where I want to go with, I... And again, a lot of times, it's just a matter of creating the idea of something, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go into extreme detail, um, as long as a viewer understands what they're seeing that this is a area of flowers, the bougainvillea. And maybe just a small amount of on the tips of these on the far side. Karen, I have a few questions coming yes. in. Is it okay to ask right now? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so Mary is asking, what is the name of the color set that you're using? And is it possible for anybody to obtain it? Yes. Um, in fact, that's that's a nice reminder. Um, I have put together uh, a few of my favorite brushes uh, for everybody that uh, has would like them, and I will have them on my website, uh, digitalartacademy.com. There's a special section there just for brushes, and uh, there are some custom brushes that I think you'll enjoy. Um, and I am happy to put this uh, uh, color set up for everybody, too. This is um, traditional Japanese colors. Um, and I believe Skip put this one together originally. And uh, I know he wouldn't mind sharing it because we have given it to all our students. So <laughs> I'm happy to pass it on to uh, anybody who's interested in it. it. It's a beautiful color set. It really has a very nice range of uh, colors to work with. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. OK, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, we've also had a couple questions about how are you shifting from the brush to sampling? Uh, I use uh, my alt key. Is that? Yep. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's just an old shortcut that I've used. I think it's become um, you know, it's just be, I, I don't tend to go over to my uh, to the toolbar if I don't have to. If I can do everything I need to do on the property bar or with a shortcut, I use it. <laughs> and over the years, I think it's just become so second nature to me that 
um, I find that I brush and sample and brush, you know, paint and sample, paint and sample. It just becomes part of my workflow and just make it's just so easy for me. So uh, it, that is uh, typically the way I'll, I'll work. Yeah. OK. And then just one more thing. It, sure. Just wondering what equipment you're working with. Right yeah, um, I'm working. Um, I am I am going to be getting a new uh, Intuos Pro 5, but right now I'm just working with the Intuos a Pro, um, and I have been for a couple of years now, but I think I'm ready to, to move on to a, a new tablet. I used Cintiq at one time, but to be honest with you, I, I just find that... Um, my attention, the way that I paint uh, using the tablet and looking at the screen is the way that I feel most comfortable painting. I, it's, it's odd because you would think coming from a traditional background, the Cintiq would be ideal, but I just never connected to it that well. I just never did. And I know that it's just a personal thing. A lot of people work with just the tablets and are happy doing that, and that's probably me. Um, but and then there's lots of people that absolutely love Cintiq and would never go back to a tablet again. So I think it's just a matter of, um, uh, you know, what your preference is and how how best you connect with your with your work. Uh, and I do from tablet to screen. That is how I connect. Um, I also use the Art Pen. Um, which I highly recommend uh, to anybody who uh, works with Painter. Uh, the the 360 degree uh, rotation of the brush is absolutely amazing. I use um, what we call uh, uh, rotation often in my brushes. So ordinarily, I would have to use uh, direction or bearing with a standard uh, pen. But with the art pen, I get that full 360 rotation. Uh, so I often uh, create brushes that give me that full uh, rotation. Um, I love painting flowers. So a lot of times uh, I need to have, if I'm painting a rose petal, I need to have that full uh, rotation of the petal as I'm putting it in and being able to lay that down in different directions. So having the art pen uh, is just key for me. And then I work with a, uh, an HP system. It's a, it's a beefed up system. It's, uh, it's uh, definitely does what I need it to do. Uh, I tend to get new computers about every two years because I just get so excited with the new technology that comes out. But uh, right now I'm, I'm pretty happy with everything. Um, and we'll probably be updating to the Intuos Pro next, Intuos 5 Pro. Okay, any other questions? Great. Um, go ahead and continue on and I'll save some questions for, I know we're getting close to the end here. Yes, oh my God. I know, it, time just goes by too fast. Um, <clears throat> The next brush was Impressionist Sunset. And uh, this one I told you I was going to show you because I, I love this brush. Um, and I would use it uh, typically um, for this type of thing where I wanted to bring in maybe a little more uh, foliage. Um, again, I told you I use that brush, uh, oh boy, for my... Uh, redwood trees and it just makes beautiful beautiful redwood trees so uh the the bark on the redwood trees so it really really is a nice brush for that very uh kind of organic in nature very much stylized by the impressionist type brushes i'm using that just to fill in and give a little more um weight to this area on the side. I tend to like to keep my edges on the soft side, so I don't go in for a lot of detail on the edges. So I try to keep my ed edges really soft. Keep that focus on the center of interest. 
And then let me go into um, again into Blue Moon. And there is a brush called Glassy Ocean. And I was thinking about, um, and I'm going to do this one on the canvas layer. Um, I was thinking that maybe it would be good to soften these uh, waterfalls down a little bit, bring them, bring the edges, soften the edges a little bit on these distant falls. And that's a good brush to use. Not so much in the foreground here. I love the way the light is just reflecting off of the tops of these falls. So this is one of the happiest parts of this painting for me. I really like that area. Uh, details. Um, and I'm trying to think which one I used for that. There is two nice detail brushes um, in two brush categories that I'll tell you about. One details in uh, Blue Moon, and the other one would be in the um, uh, Mystic Mountain, and that would be the number five landscape brush. And again, that's one of those kind of go-to brushes that uh, I tend to use a lot. And for this, I would probably, uh, you know, just go into uh, some of these areas, um, you know, looking at some of the, the little finer little details and colors that I can change here. You know, do I like what's on the roof? Do I need, a, you know, some more shadow in certain areas? I like I like detail in paintings. I, I there are some of my students that have and are capable of such beautiful detail. Um, I like detail, but I don't like going too far with it because I think um, that's just kind of the type of painter I am. I tend to find that myself if I start getting too tight, then I um, my paintings will reflect that, and I. I like to be a little looser in the way that I approach my painting. Um, now, I talked to you about the canvas overlay, and I also talked to you, and there's one other thing that sometimes I will do too. Um, I, uh, again, I was mentioning how much I love, uh, you know, working with texture. And a lot of times what I'll do is create these canvases and uh, use those as overlays on top of the painting. And they can really change the painting a lot, too. They can add a lot of interest. Uh, the idea that you can work with the opacity on that layer makes a big difference. But if I wanted to give that painting a little bit of a canvas effect, then I could certainly uh, use this as an overlay. And the way that I do these is by using the file place command, and then I'll bring in these textures. And uh, a lot of times, if I don't like the color, uh, it may just be a, a typical uh, tan canvas, and I might want to change the color of it. Then I can go to my effects menu and go to uh, something like uh, um, uh, color overlay uh, and and give it a completely different uh, look uh, using a different color and working with the opacity. Uh, so there's so many wonderful ways that you can change your paintings uh, to give them different effects. And I think that's part of the reason that, uh, again, Painter is so powerful in that respect. Um, there's a there's a, I think I gave uh, Tanya one of the tips uh, for the month was working with one of my favorite effects called match palette. And um, not everybody knows about this little effect here. And it's a wonderful tool to um, if, if a painting that you've been working on may have gotten out of gamut in terms of the, the overall color scheme that you're working with, it may have gotten too yellow or too green or too blue or whatever 
whatever. And you want to bring it back into a, a color gamut that, that feels better. Then discover match palette. Um, you can uh, check out the, the tip um, or open up your help files and it'll tell you exactly how to use match palette. But I will often use it with some of the master's paintings, uh, Richard Schmidt and some of the artists that uh, James Gurney and some of the artists that I just love out there and I love their color palettes that they use. Um, bring those paintings in and actually take from that painting and apply into your current painting so you can create some very special effects and bring everything back into harmony and get started right again, get going on your painting even further. So this is just, uh, this is just a, you know, I wish I could spend two or three hours just painting and painting and painting because uh, there's, there's so much more that goes into my process, but I wanted you to really understand that these brushes, uh, these Bob Ross brushes um, are really a, a powerful brush category to have in your uh, arsenal and uh, that they are brushes that are not only fun brushes to use, but there are, they are brushes that you may end up using over and over again, and they become part of your, uh, part of your process in your work too, uh, as they have in mine. Um, the Mystic Mountain brush category, I'll just uh, close with, um, there are two brushes in here, the two inch landscape and the number five painting knife, which is absolutely one of my favorite thick paint brushes to use. Uh, so there's a good combination of thick paint and traditional brushes uh, in this category that, that work uh, really beautifully for you. Those foliage brushes, um, foliage and trees, the uh, frosted foliage, all of those, um, uh, all of those brushes were used to create the distant um, you know, to develop these distant green areas of uh, tropical uh, foliage. Okay, so um, if there's no other questions or uh, does Tanya have any more questions? You know, I just have a couple for you. Um, they, they were wondering what brushes do you use for waterfalls and flowers? Mm. Do you have any particular ones? Yes, um, I do. And in fact, I will include uh, two of those brushes that I use um, for waterfalls. Um, I did use just the basic um, two inch landscape brush for these waterfalls here. Um, they wor it works very well, but I do have a couple that I that I just love. Um, one of them is. Uh, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can get to this real quick here. This brush, uh, let's see, called Droplets Dab. This brush, the way you want to use this uh, brush is that you just want to use it with your mouse and tap with it. Um, and let me see if I can get a color that's going to come out here nicely. And you'll see that all you need to do is just tap. And I love it for flowers. It makes beautiful flowers. Um, in fact, let me see if I have, um, this was the redwood trees. We didn't really get back into that. Um, but I do have one here. Okay, so this is what I use for flowers on this brush, on this painting, Droplets Dab. And you can see that all I do is just tap it in and where where I want them. And I just love the kind of organic look that it creates. Uh, it By tapping it in using your uh, mouse, you get all different sizes that come out nicely from small to mid. And of course, you can change the brush size also and get different, uh, different effects that way as well. And the other brush that I really love for uh, waterfalls is, um, and let me, I know that I have that in here too, uh, but that's in this one. This brush called Pastel Gold Standard, and I will put this in the brush category as well, uh, in the brushes I'm going to give you guys. Um, it is 
perhaps one of my favorite. It's it's more of a, um, a pastel type of brush, but it uh, it's highly um, if you want to work with paper texture, it's a beautiful, beautiful brush for paper texture. It, uh, you know, as you can see, it's got these nice uh, organic um, broken edges that, um, you know, are very painterly in quality. So in terms of waterfall, um, let me do this real quick here. Uh, get a nice dark color here. And I'll just do a light color. But in terms of waterfall, uh, am I on a color? I'm on that wrong color here. You can see that it would be a really nice brush for creating waterfalls. And then when you take the reset setting down to zero, then you can softly kind of blend the edges. And uh, it's one of my students' favorite brushes, too. They, they really, really like this pastel uh, standard, gold, gold standard. So you can see that it's a really nice expressive brush. And so that would be a, a good one for, for waterfalls. And then within... Um, Let's see, within the uh, Sunset Aglow, I'm trying to think if there's any, any here. Sunset Lake would be good for waterfalls if you have the um, Sunset Aglow brush category. Even Trunks is good for waterfalls because it's so expressive. Uh, you can really, you know, create kind of a waterfall effect And then you can take a blender and soften the edges as you need. So this would be also a good one. You get that waterfall effect with that one too. Okay. You make it look so easy. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I, would, I guess another thing I'd say is that, you know, when you become um, familiar with your brushes and you start gathering those brushes over the years that that always work magic for you you start to understand what those brushes will do for you as well and there might be a brush that you use to paint flowers with but it also creates great rocks or also creates great tree tree trunks and things like that so you know there's lots of flexibility within our brushes um, uh, you know, so you don't take them for face value. If it says it's for painting leaves, it might even be good for painting flowers too. So, um, you know, explore and, you know, don't limit yourself to just the name of the brush because the name goes far beyond a lot of times what the brush is capable of doing. And that is so true. Yes. <laughs> And there's so many of them. <laughs> I think that that's the part that becomes overwhelming. But like I said, the more that you use painter, uh, painter essentials, whatever you're into uh, in, in the painter world, you know, you're going to find those brushes. Uh, and this is so true. Those brushes that work magic in your hands. Uh, and they'll they'll probably be, you know, maybe 20 to 30 of those brushes that you absolutely call upon all the time. But don't limit yourself either because stretch stretch it out and, and be able to go out and find new brushes and new technology within those brushes that make it happen. And combine a lot of those wonderful things with those brushes like experiment with composite methods, experiment with paper texture. Uh, you know, that's where it's all, you know, that's what it's all about in Painter, you know, being able to uh, even go to the next level. Exactly. Need to have a little bit of patience and some time to explore. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I wanted to remind everybody that Karen does have 
a Bob Ross painting course going on at Digital Art Academy. I may have missed it. You probably mentioned it, but I just wanted to remind everybody. And I also failed to mention that for those of you that had purchased, you know, maybe one or two Bob Ross packs, the individual packs are also on sale for half price. Um, so you don't have to buy the bundle. If you need to buy more than two packs, you might as well buy the bundle, even if you have duplicates, because the bundle price is $29.99. Um, so that's, you can find that either in app or online. I'm going to send a link in the follow up from GoToWebinar to the purchase for the store. And Karen, um, for all of this wonderful content that you were going to post, I don't know if it's already up in Digital Art Academy or if you're going to be posting it, but I can also add that link to the follow-up email so everybody can easily find it. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll have those brushes up by the end of the day for everybody. Okay, that's and so the, good. And the color set. <laughs> great, thank you so much. <laughs> thank um, you, everybody, I really appreciate it. It's yeah, been well, I can't thank you enough for all your help with everything Bob Ross, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without you. And um, we do have another webinar tomorrow for anybody that joined this one that's actually an Essentials user. Oops, sorry guys. Somebody's trying to get me into a meeting. <laughs> it's <laughs> I apologize. But Karen, thank you tremendously for this. I know we'll have you back again for a webinar sometime soon. And thanks to everybody for joining. You can look for our follow-up email. It'll go out tomorrow. So have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, bye.